So I've started Paraview, and so I need to put in the right directory. For examples, 3D hex 8. We need to switch to output. So here you see the different uh, files that were written. There was output over the domain. That's this bottom one. There was no sort of dash prefix. There's the out solution over the ground surface, the state variable information, sorry, the information about the physical properties in the info file, the state variables in the T0 file, the upper crust, same thing, info and T0. Let's look at our solutions. So here again, our left mouse button does rotation. We can zoom in and zoom out with the scroll wheel and then translate. Oops. Also zoom in and zoom out. Translate is the middle mouse button. So it's a light, slightly different than Cubic. Uh, up here in the upper left, I can select what field I want to look at. So here's my displacement. It defaults to magnitude. So this is the magnitude. I can represent it. As, I can show the points. I can show the out, just the outline. And show the surface, the surface with the cell edges. So now we can see the mesh on top of there. Or I can do the volume. Whoops, cannot render volume data. Okay. Or the wireframe, the see through wireframe. So let's do the surface. And so I want to actually see what the deformation looks like. So this icon here with this. Warp by vector, that's this curving green shape here, which gives me a scale factor. I'm going to warp things by a factor of a thousand, so a meter will move things by a factor of a kilometer. Uh, that looks a little much, so let's back off to 500. So here you can see what the deformation looks like. This is just pure, simple shear. Let's add on the displacement vector. So that's this sort of globe looking thing here called the glyphs. Uh, let's just say apply. It auto scales everything. So there you can see what the deformation looks like. So you can see that I've um, squeezed the sides. So I have compression as well as shear. And I can say, well, let's see. Let's, here's my original. Configuration. Let's make the original configuration in wireframe. So over here on the left, I can those little eyes. If you see the eyes in gray, that means they're turned off. They're dark. They're turned on. So there's my original domain, um, and then my deformed domain in solid. Uh, if I want to do the glyphs from my original domain, let's delete those. Go back here. Select uh, my original one, and do the glyphs. Now, if I also want to, in the glyphs, if I select a scale factor of 500, so I edit the scale factor, select 500, then we'll get arrows that go from my original location to my deformed location. And notice when I squeeze, you can see the fun effect and things to uh, uplift near the top because I have a lower boundary condition at the bottom. And I can also bring in my ground surface. So let's bring in the ground surface. Let's do its displacement. Turn off my volume. Whoops, that was my glyph. Turn off my warp by vector. So there's just the ground surface in solid. Let's warp it. So warp by a factor of 500. Same as our volume. And whoops, I warped the wrong thing. So I had the, I saw the glyph selected. I want to work the ground displacement. So I select the ground displacement. Work by a factor of 500. There's my ground surface. And it's now just been worked. So that's the solution. You can ask, if you have a quantity study problem, you can ask for velocities as well. And you can plot then both displacements and velocities. You can plot the vectors if you just want the second, say the components. So say I want to just uh, see the x component. There's my x component colored in. If I want a color scale, I go up here and click the color bar. 
Uh, and then this little left right area will rescale the definition. Here's my Y component. There's the Z component. I'll go back to magnitude. I want to edit the color map. I can change the color map, choose a different preset color map. So let's say I want just, uh, oh, that's the default one, the virgin. If I want sort of the more, sort of the rainbow, I can get the rainbow color map. Uh, with the displacement magnitude, we scaled. Oops, and you can drag the color bar around. You, uh, you can use log scaling. Um, as well as the comic. You can change, I want to go, I want to skip the, oops. Click over here in the little gear box of preferences, I can scale the values, choose the color space, um, change the not automatically rescale, so I can set the value to 0, 1.5, set my own scale, um, change the number of colors, I can change the annotation, the legend, I can say just like displacement in meters, change the fonts as well, so now displacement meters, I've changed the color scale you know, from 0 to 1.5, notice the here the displacement is not zero in the middle. Um, and that sort of gives you an idea of what you can do in Paraview. Um, are there questions on using Paraview? Okay. I don't see any questions. So do we have we have about twelve minutes left in this first session? I know it's just sort of a a quick overview. We'll dive deeper into meshing and some various problems. Um, but do we have do we have any general questions so far? Or even more specific ones? So we'll be covering uh, a dipping fault example um, in the next session, uh, and it will we'll cover both a 2D uh, subduction zone um, that's discussed in uh, the uh, 2D subduction zone directory, and then there will be um, also a 3D subduction zone. Both of those actually use a, a non-planar fault surface. If you want a planar fault surface, it's pretty easy uh, to just rotate the surface around. Um, so uh, there you have sort of sort of the more realistic case of taking uh, a the, a surface that you may be getting from say a seismic reflection profile or some other information that a geologist provides to you. Um, and uh, but in Qubit you can actually rotate the surfaces so we could have taken our original fault surface and simply rotated it um, about uh, either the x or y axis to create a dipping fault plane. Uh, but and the meshing is essentially the same uh, in terms of a dipping fault plane.
Any other questions? Okay, well, one other thing we can look at is what a spatial database file looks like. Let's go back to uh, open up the text editor here, and I'll look at 3D Hex 8 spatial DB6 displacement axial shear. So let me get a better font size here. So this is what our spatial database file looks like. It has a header. It says that we have comments that use the C++ style. So that's up here. We then have a header that that's the this is the the type of file. So this is like a magic header that sort of verifies that yes, I'm looking at a ASCII spatial database file and it's sort of a version one. Then we have information about the values within the spatial database. You know how many points are given or sorry. What, how many values are given in the spatial database, the names of those values. So for our, we want to specify displacements. Uh, we use the form displacement-x, displacement-y, displacement-z, the units of those values. So if you could, you can give your displacements in millimeters or meters, um, and those are automatically converted into uh, the meters or standard SI units and then non-dimensionalized. The number of locations in the database, uh, the data dimension, so uh, a 0D or 1 point is a uniform. That would be a data dimension of 0. 1 means 1D, so a linear variation. With It can be just two points, or it can be the control points along a linear variation, so three points, four points, five points, ten points. Uh, they don't have to be evenly spaced. Pilot will say, will figure out where the values are within the, and do the and linear interpolation, what spatial dimension I am, and then a coordinate system. In this case, we're just using a simple Cartesian coordinate system, um, but we're going to, in, in the coordinates below, we're going to specify them in kilometers. So we have a scaling factor here, how to convert uh, back to meters. And so we just, for our Cartesian coordinate system, we say a factor of 1,000. Um, our coordinate system has a spatial dimension as well. Yes, this is redundant with this value up here, um, but we do that because there's other places where uh, we give the coordinate system um, that we don't have the, the space dimension up here. Um, and there's some Cartesian, there's some coordinate systems that, uh, like geographic coordinates, are uh, implicitly the spatial dimension is given. Uh, we have more comments here just to define what our values are. Then we have a list of values where we have x, y, and z, and then our values for displacement x, displacement y, and displacement z. So here on the minus 3x, that's minus 3 kilometers, that's the left-hand side, uh, we're going to have an x displacement of 1, a y displacement of minus 1, a z displacement of 0. On the plus uh, plus three, that's the right hand side. We have uh, x displacement of minus one, y displacement of plus one, and a z displacement of zero. And so this is sort of our initial, you could think of this as sort of our initial conditions for the entire problem or the entire volume. Um, and when for our left hand side, we'll essentially just be using these values here, and the right-hand side will be using these values down here. That, that's where all linear interpolation will work. And then when we're in between, it would be linearly interpolating between these two values. But of course, uh, by only using plus x, minus x bases, and then the bottom, for the bottom, we're just going to be using these, this far right-hand column, and the values are the same. Um, so we can, if we were to use the plus and minus y faces, then um, it would actually linear interpolate between these two values. But this, basically, we can specify in this single file are this various um, sort of dis initial displacement field, and then we can pick which uh, boundaries we want to apply it to, um, independent of what our, our spatial resolution of our mesh looks like.
And if we look at our spatial database for our material properties, so let's look at matte elastic. In this case, we just have one value, so its data dimensions is zero. We have density Vs and Vp, so we give our elastic properties in terms of shear wave speed and P wave speed. And density, then we then may convert this to the, uh, the Lamé constants mu and lambda. We give our units here, so kilograms per meter cube. Uh, here are our values down here, our single point, and then our density Vs and Vp. Uh, and this is a Poisson solid where uh, mu and lambda are equal to each other. So this is the square root of three with uh, a lot of significant digits uh, times their, uh, three kilometers per second or 3,000 meters per second for our shear wave speed. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions at this time. We're pretty much at the end of this first session. We've got our hands dirty a little bit working through a problem. In the next session uh, and in the following sort of five sessions, there will be a lot fewer slides, a lot more sort of hands-on time uh, running examples and uh, playing around with uh, you know, what the output looks like, what the input looks like, and so forth. In the next session, we're just going to look at meshing, and we'll be using meshing using qubit. We'll do, uh, Charles will do a 2D example, then a 3D example, and then do a, a case where we're going to specify what the discretization size is um, from outside qubit. So we'll bring in a much more complicated spatial variation of discretization size um, than what qubit would sort of you do through the qubit graphical user interface um, with either a uniform resolution or specifying uh, the variation uh, in of the discretization size along curves. We're actually going to specify the spatial variation within the volume using either an analytical function in one case or a spatial database in another uh, uh, example. So that's showing just the power of being able of these spatial databases they can really specify the variation of uh, any parameter and then the library can interpolate that um, so that's it for this first session uh, we hope you'll come back for the other sessions you can feel free to work through examples in the next couple hours uh, we'll try to respond to any emails um, It'll be dinner time for me, and it'll be probably lunch time for Charles. Um, but we'll try and keep up, and we can, since there's such a sort of a small group for this schedule, we can come back and we can start with questions, um, and then 